everyone and welcome to another episode of Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd. On today's program, we're going to be taking a look at an urban rainwater conservation program. We're gonna hear about some pumpkin growing tips and we'll have some fun identifying caterpillars. Let's start our show by going out west to see some fantastic ornamentals. We're joined by Amy Seiler from the Nebraska Forest Service as she shows us some beautiful plants that thrive in the hot, dry weather of western Nebraska. We are out here in beautiful western Nebraska on a brisk fall day enjoying the final colors of the landscape. We're right at the base of the Scotch Bluff National Monument and we are in a great plants demonstration garden. And what we have here today are just the beautiful final colors of fall. Beautiful asters, grasses, and shrubs that give the explanation point to the end of the season. Today we're going to talk about some of the textures and colors to wrap up the season and take us into fall. In front of us we have beautiful fall asters. This variety is October Skies. Great upright form, super color, has this magnificent structure to it that really adds to the landscape. It's been a wonderful pollinator all throughout the fall for the many, many painted ladies that have traveled through. In front of me, we also have this fascinating textural plant. This is called wild senna. And this first blooms this beautiful yellow flower late summer and then puts on this extremely beautiful show of seed pods all throughout the winter. I'll tell you, this fall splash is interesting, but check this plant out in the winter time with a little bit of frost on these pods and it's just something to look at all year long. In the garden over here, not only do we have great seed heads, but we also have wonderful silver foliage color coming off of the Mongolian Carragena. This is such an interesting upright pea shrub and it has this great silver foliage that is very exciting to look at, particularly in the fall with the backdrop of the grasses and the flowers. Behind me is another one of these really interesting upright grasses. This is north wind switchgrass. It has a really unique upright form. It reminds me of soldiers standing at attention and this is one of these ornamental grasses. If you don't have a lot of space in your landscape, you can utilize this plant and it should do well. Fall is one of my favorite times of the year, particularly to do design work in the gardens. I love all the different textures and colors, and this garden has plenty of that kind of interest. Right in front of me, we have this fantastic rabbit brush. This plant looks great in the summer. It's got a beautiful golden yellow flower in late August, but my favorite attribute of this plant is this wonderful seed head that it puts on late in the fall. I love its showiness, but what I particularly love is what the seed head looks like when it's backlit by the sunlight. It's one of my favorite plants in the garden. Next to me down here is this totally different texture from the rabbit brush. This is Plains Muley Grass and I love this soft fuzzy texture. I love the yellow colors mixed with the green. It's just a soft plant and what I really love and you can see it on a day like today is how it moves in the wind. It doesn't move, it dances and that's one of my favorite qualities about this particular plant. In front of me we have this great little blue stem and I love the texture of the seed head but what has that great pizzazz is this great red fall color. Most of these plants 
do very well with very minimal water. And that's what's so beneficial about this garden demonstration, is this garden is only watered very periodically throughout the summer. Maybe like this summer, it only got planted, or excuse me, watered probably two or three times during our July season month that did not have a lot of moisture. These plants perform best with actually very limited fertilization and very limited water. If they get too much of either of those, they will grow too tall and flop and we won't have this great form or color so that we can enjoy it in the fall. The great thing about those plants is that they'll put on a show when they're blooming in the summer. And as we've just seen, they have some wonderful qualities during the late fall and through the winter. And as Amy said, after they're established, they'll tolerate droughty conditions. We've tried to give beginning gardeners some basic ideas about growing plants the right way with our Go Gardening features. This week we thought we'd try something fun like growing pumpkins. They're relatively easy to grow if you follow a few simple rules. Let's take a few minutes to hear about what it takes to have pumpkins ready for Thanksgiving pie or Halloween. For this week's Go Gardening series for beginning gardeners, I thought we'd focus on how to grow pumpkins. We have a lot of really great commercial pumpkin growers in the state. This is for you home gardeners who don't necessarily want two or three or five acres. You just like to plant a hill or two, or if you really do have some space, maybe a row or two. Here's the deal about pumpkins. They absolutely can't stand the cold temperatures, and that means soil temps. So ideally, you're going to direct seed your pumpkins when the soil temps are at least 70 degrees and holding. Higher is way better. They much prefer full sun, but they will actually tolerate light shade. And one of the great ways actually to grow them uh, in, in larger areas is pumpkin vines running along under corn if you have uh, sweet corn or field corn. Direct seeding, as I said, is best. If you really want to or you have short season or a long day length or a, or a long season length pumpkin that you're trying to grow, you can start them indoors. You don't want to disturb the roots. Ideally, you will do them in a hill. The hill does a couple of things, and that would be, first off, it gives you good drainage. The soil will warm up a little bit faster, allows those vines or even the bush type to kind of have their own space. You plant three to five seeds in a hill. Once they emerge, you cut off the ones that you don't want, leaving only about two. You don't want to dig them up because, again, those roots are shallow and they really resent disturbance. They are heavy feeders. Ideally, you will have amended the soil to begin with. First off, you know what your soil has in it. You've done that soil test. Great amendments include well-composted manure or compost itself. Just build that into that hill or into that row to begin with. Once those pumpkins emerge, you're going to want to make sure that you apply fertilizer at the right times. And again, you can side dress with compost or manure. We want a high end fertilizer early on uh, as they're putting on their foliage. We want to kick over to a phosphorus, a higher uh, phosphorus level when they're flowering. Also, one of the things about growing pumpkins and actually getting them to fruit is you may want to consider row covers before they start flowering and that will help keep out all of those insects or most of those insects that really can cause problems with a pumpkin crop. Whether it is squash vine borer, which is a terrible one, cucumber beetles, those kinds of things. You want to remove those row covers so the bees can come in and pollinate. These are absolutely a bee pollinated plant. And one of the things that we get questions on is my pumpkins flowered, but then the flowers fell off and I didn't get any pumpkins. Almost always early in the season, which, or early in the flowering season, what you get is you get almost exclusively male flowers first. They don't last very long, they fall off. So once conditions are right, the females start, the male flowers are there, the bees are flying, you get some pumpkins. Now to keep the vines from spreading all over the place and then put that energy back into developing the fruit, pinch off the tip of that vine once you have enough fruit set on the vine. And, and again, then the vines will stop trailing. You wanna make sure that as the season progresses, you really scout for those insects. 
Ideally with the pumpkins, you will turn them or flip them very, very carefully. Don't injure the stem, don't injure the vines. You can slide a piece of, of plastic or mesh under them so they don't get dirty. You let them harden off completely really before you, before you uh, harvest them and you take as much stem as possible when you do because they're gonna last longer when you bring them in. Tons and tons of different varieties of pumpkins. They will cross pollinate. So I collect pumpkin seeds and I have them labeled for the pumpkin that I smashed to get them out of and I have no idea whether this year when I plant my pumpkins, I'm actually going to get small warty thing or I'm going to get something that looks like an alien beast. Of course, you don't have to wonder what sort of pumpkin you're going to get at the end of the season if you buy those seeds at the garden center. But collecting seeds, planting them again next season is part of the fun of gardening. You might think in the dead of winter that your trees really don't require any attention at all. What went into the fall and winter is probably going to come right back out in the spring the same, correct? Well, we know that Nebraska winters can be quite harsh. Your trees can't go inside to warm up or keep consistent temperatures. So for this week's landscape lesson, we're going to show you what those extreme temperatures and sun scald can do to your trees. We get an awful lot of questions on Backyard Farmer about cracks in tree trunks. So I thought for this week's landscape lesson, we'd talk a little bit about how they can form and what you can do about them. This is an example of what we see in the landscape. And we sort of use the words sun scald and frost crack in the same sentence, in the same tone of voice for the same trees. So let's talk about sun scald first. This is almost always on the south and west or southwest sides of a thin barked or a young tree. What happens is that side of the trunk can warm up 20 degrees even, warmer than the north side in these nice winter days. Temperatures drop at night. All of the, the sap that has risen and that bark shrinks back again and scald occurs. And there's damage oftentimes to the cambium layer and what happens then is you get this wounding or this opening up. Sun scald occurs on specific species, but as I said, it also can occur on thin bark trees. Frost crack is essentially the same sort of damage in a slightly different way. Typically on the same side of the tree, those abrupt temperature drops, but what happens is scientists believe that the moisture or the water moves out of cells and then because of the pressure between or the tension between the outer bark and the inner bark, you get this basically explosion and you can actually hear a frost crack when it is severe enough. Now frost cracks can close and reopen, close and reopen over time for years and years. You'll see a frost crack as big as my hand and then, geez, at the end of the summer or during the growing season, it has closed back up, opens back up again. What you also can see is the formation of that callus tissue along the edges. With sun scald, you see the same sort of thing happen with the callus tissue. Either of those can be really, really good places for insects, pests, and diseases to enter. So treatment or management, the ideal thing is to go ahead and wrap those trunks with a light reflecting heat reflecting material, something that is light so that you don't get that abrupt change in temperature. Take that wrap off so you don't get pests and diseases underneath it in the spring. The other thing that some people do, and this is particularly true in orchards, is they will take a very th a thinned latex-based white paint and just paint the trunk. And that does exactly the same thing. It keeps those temperatures from fluctuating. So one of the best things you can do is make sure you know what you're looking at before you make a decision to do some treatment that really wouldn't work for either a frost crack or a sun scald. It's just as important for you to take care of your trees going into the winter as it is when warmer weather comes our way. If you know what you're looking for and you do practice some of these tips, you'll find that your trees will be much more vigorous and healthy next spring and they probably won't develop those sun scalds or those frost cracks. If it's creepy, crawly, stripy, fuzzy, or looks like a gummy worm, you're probably looking at a caterpillar. Now, some of those caterpillars are really worth keeping around. Others turn into different sorts of creatures. 
How do we tell the difference? For this week's interview, we've asked our bug guide, Jim Kalish, to talk about a few of them and to help you know what you're looking at. Here's Jim to tell us more. I'm really happy to have Jim Kalish with me today. We're gonna to be talking about confusion with caterpillars. All right, Jim, would you describe the differences to our audience between monarch caterpillars and swallowtail caterpillars? And then of course the adults, which I think is a little bit easier, but it's that caterpillar thing that has people all confused. So yeah, sure I can do that. It's pretty quick. You know, one thing that we all have to remember too is host plant because you're only gonna find uh, monarch caterpillars on milkweed host plants and nothing else exclusively. So that caterpillar of course is striped and uh, black, white, yellowish stripe that go across the body. And then it has these floppy little tendril things that stick out toward the front that are black. And so there's nothing on it otherwise. But like with the swallowtail uh, caterpillars, we're gonna find Oh, a variation of stripes and spots. Like with black swallowtail, we have variations of black and white stripes and yellow spots. And then there's little tiny little tubercles or projections on the top of the body. But uh, if you dare squeeze one of them, it's kind of interesting because these, this forked smelly thing comes out and uh, it's orange in coloration. And uh, that's one of the characteristics of that family of swallowtails. That's a defense mechanism because that stuff smells awful. So same way with the tiger swallowtail as well. Now the tiger swallowtail is really swollen, not, not greenish, has those eye spots on the front. But again, when it's disturbed or pressured by the fingers or whatever, when you pick it up, out come of those osmoteria, which are the name of those smelly things that come out that are orange. And then again with the larvae or the caterpillars of the swallowtails, uh, black swallowtail especially, you're gonna find them all on plants in the carrot family. So that would mean like what? Um, carrot, dill, anise, um, cilantro, those kinds of plants. And so um, that's essentially, that's what you find them on those plants and they're kind of a striped, spotted, yellowish, attractive caterpillar. That's what they be in the swallowtail family, black swallowtails. Jim, another one that really has people confused is the difference between Polyphemus cecropia and those darn tomato hornworms. And that again is both the caterpillars and the adult moths. So could you clarify that one for our audiences? Essentially though, we start out with uh, the larvae or the caterpillars of each are all going to be green. You notice that the moths or the adults themselves are quite different. All right, so like with cecropia caterpillar, it's large and greenish and it has a whole bunch of colorful spiny tubercles all over its body as protection. So they would be red, blue, yellow color uh, in that kind of color. So prickly, hard to touch and very large. And you'd find this on a number of different plants. We think like apple, we think about uh, lilac and other kinds of related plants. All right, where Polyphemus is, it's a beautiful iridescent green and it has just hairs on its body. It's a little bit more squat in size, not as long and not as large. And so we find that on a number of different kinds of host trees and shrubs. Um, maple and oak are, are some of the favorites as well as uh, um, dogwood, yeah, okay. And then, obviously, trees and shrubs for those two large moths, but now we get down to the hornworms. Now, they're beautiful, and there are some good ones in the family, but we often think about the, the tomato and tobacco hornworms, and they're large and greenish. The host plants for the sphinx moths, or the tomato hornworm and tobacco hornworm, obviously, tomato, tobacco, pepper plants, and related types of vegetable garden crops. And so they feed on the same thing. They look about the same um, being large and green, but there's a distinctive tail, a very sharp uh, husky tail on the tip of the abdomen on the end of the body. And so they're called hornworms, obviously, because they have that horn as well. And then they have some stripes on the, on the sides. The tobacco hornworm has uh, just chevron, or just straight, straight stripes. And then uh, the tomato hornworm has chevron uh, stripes. So both again, large, but remember that horn on the tip of the body and only in the tomato, the nightshade family, the crops that, that are in that family. All right, in true entomology fashion, you have actually discovered a live creature. 
that is an insect, not a rodent or anything else, and you have brought that to us. Can you tell us what this one turns into and what's going to happen because you found it alive? Interesting, yeah. Essentially what I did was, this was on Groundhog's Day, and in the entomology world, what do we have? We have, don't have groundhogs, but this comes close. This is the woolly bear caterpillar that everybody thinks that somehow it tells us how long our winter is going to be based on how long that reddish band is in the body. And this is all pure poppycock, but you know, at one time people really believed it. But essentially this was alive on Groundhog's Day. And so I don't know, it could go either way. We could have six more weeks of snow and cold weather, or maybe we'll have an early spring, I'm not sure. But interesting that it's still alive, not hungry. Um, it's waiting to go somewhere else and hide again until winter returns and then it will eat a little bit more and develop and turn into one of those beautiful um, tiger moth, uh, beautiful tiger moths that emerge in early spring. Jim, thanks for sharing all that great identification information with us. We'll look forward to more on Backyard Farmer this spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's my pleasure to share all this stuff in advance of the coming spring and summer when all those butterflies and moths are everywhere. Sometimes the good guys will be eating up plants in your garden that you really want to keep. Let them stick around and eat and hopefully you'll have enough produce that it won't bother you that much. After what you've seen on the segment, you'll be better equipped to know who's a friend, what to identify, who is who, who turns into what, and who needs to go bother somebody else's garden. Alrighty, let's take a few minutes to answer your email questions. You can submit those questions and the JPEG pictures via email to byf at unl.edu. Our first question comes from a Lincoln viewer, and we've answered this before, maybe even this winter on this show, but it is showing up again. So, this is a viewer that has all this damage high in the branches of maples in this case. She's wondering what happened, what caused it, is it going to cause the branches to die? How can she avoid this happening in the future? This would be our beloved squirrels, or tree rats as some people call them, that are chewing off all the bark on those maple trees. And what they're after is a couple of things. Perhaps it is nutrients under the bark, Perhaps it is sharpening of their incisors and stripping of the bark. Unfortunately, every, bar every branch that is completely devoid of bark is now a former branch from the point of the damage out. So you need to get that pruned out in the spring of the year. Um, early is better than later. They'll break other buds along those stems if they're high in the crowns of the trees. And we've seen this a lot in, in uh, elm in maple that are maybe 10 or 20 inches, even 20 inches in diameter, way high in the crown, you're going to get some new tufted growth potentially, um, knowing again that squirrels are creatures of habit. They may come back and do the same thing over again. So the damage can really be severe in certain uh, winters and this looks like it's one of those winters. Nebraska's most precious resource is water and we've seen what a lack of water can do in our communities in recent times of drought. A lot of cities and towns across the state have made a conscious effort to collect and reuse rainwater in urban settings. As we wrap up today's program, we're going to hear from Amy Seiler again. She's going to show us what one town in western Nebraska is doing to conserve and reuse rainwater. Urban stormwater can be very difficult to control, but there are a few solutions that are very helpful particularly for homeowners and for municipalities. One solution to capturing some of this rainwater and filtering out pollutants and particulates is capturing that water in a rain garden. I'm down here in downtown Scotts Bluff and I am in one of the City of Scotts Bluff stormwater department's demonstration gardens and it is a perfect example of how to capture stormwater off a large parking lot pull that water into a landscape bed and have the plants be the working infrastructure that captures that water and filters it before it goes into our rivers. Plant selection is very important in order for your rain garden to be successful. In the bottom of this rain garden, we have sedges. This is a plant that's very tolerant of high moisture conditions, but 
In our hot summer months of July and August, when it's not raining, these plants actually do very well with limited water as well. When you're planting your rain garden, you also want to have plants that are very drought tolerant to be along the edges. Behind me, I have catmint and yarrow. These are two plants that are very tolerant of dry conditions. Behind me, I have switchgrass and little blue stem. And those switchgrass will tolerate moisture or limited moisture and little blue stem would prefer to be on the edges where you don't need to think about watering it often. Another great way to manage urban stormwater is to utilize a bioswale to capture and claim that water. Behind me is a wonderful functioning bioswale. We're at the Scotts Bluff Public Library where we have another demonstration garden showcasing how to capture storm water and clean it before it goes into the storm drains. Bioswales are, are not just specific plants that are beautiful, but a group of plants working together to produce a filter for that water. What we like to use in bioswales is plants with very deep roots. And behind me, you see lots of native prairie plants. We utilize these plants because they develop these intense root systems, which open up the soil structure and help filter that water. Also, it catches a lot of debris before it goes in to the inlet, which is at the base of this bioswale. There are many beautiful plants that you can incorporate into these gardens, but be sure that you think about if the plants want to be sitting in water or if they want to be a little bit high and dry. You can use both of these types of plants. You just want to use them in groups and make sure that you have a lot of diversity in your garden. It really isn't that difficult to make a few changes here and there to use rainwater more efficiently, either in your community or just in your home landscape. Rain gardens, bioswales, and drought-resistant native plants are not only a smart way to conserve water, they can also be quite beautiful in any setting. Thank you so much for joining us again for Lifestyle Gardening. For our final program of 2018, we're going to be looking at pruning yews and junipers, controlling squash bug pests, and we'll interview a landscape design expert. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Good afternoon, good gardening, Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening.